your hands. You are responsible. That's why we chose that title. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, Paul tells us what? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We're told that our bodies are Christ's purchased possession, and we're not at liberty to do with them as we please. All who understand the laws of health should realize their obligation to obey these laws. Obedience to the laws of health is to be made a matter of personal duty. We ourselves must suffer the results of the violated law. We must individually answer to God for our habits and practices, and I would like to just interject there, you are not responsible for what anybody else does other than if you have children to teach them. Therefore, the question with us is not what is the world's practice, but how shall I, as an individual, treat this habitation that God has given to me? So my challenge to you today is to try Daniel's diet, and you'll find in Daniel chapter 2. They started with the... Um, fruits, grains, nuts, and vegetables for 10 days. And at the end of that time, they found, the, the scholars and all found that they were fairer and wiser. They did well on their exams. And you will find also that you will do better just in a few days. So I challenge you to try that. You'll also be able to see and understand things more clearly, and that's what I want for you. When you come here, you can hear what I'm saying and, and hang on to it. We will be drawing on the wisdom of our Creator who designed our bodies. He's given us plenty of instruction. We just need to read it and heed it. Tonight our title is Examining Meals, and we will look at planning, spacing, and combining foods. So I've put a couple of pictures up there. This guy's kind of puzzled of what to buy, and we all have asked ourselves at one time or another, what's for dinner? What shall I fix? I have all these things in my cupboard and in my refrigerator, but I just don't know what to fix. So we're going to try to address some of those questions tonight. This is um, principles of eating. Um, I've given you the handout and I'll go through that with you now. I've listed some principles that if you will follow, they will help you to feel better as you work with the way your body was designed to work and function by the master designer. So the first one we talked about yesterday a little bit. And then you'll find that I review and pull things in from previous lessons because we need to keep remembering. We have to chew our food thoroughly. Digestion begins in the mouth. If our food is not mixed well with the enzymes in the mouth, it will not be completely digested. There are no teeth in your stomach. Now you might chuckle at that, but I actually had a young man come to me he was 26 years old. He was having some problems with his kidneys, and he was also constipated. So I was working with him on those issues, but I was also teaching him as he came for treatments every few days. And um, one of the things I taught him was this principle, you have to take the time to chew your food. He goes, really? I didn't know that. I thought I just had to chew it enough to swallow it, and my teeth would take care. My stomach had teeth in it; would take care of the rest of it. And I said, "No, doesn't happen that way. You have to take the time." So I chuckle every time I think of that man. It's best to allow four to five hours between each meal. Not only does it take three to four hours for our most food to digest, but our stomach needs a little rest in between. 
Yesterday we talked about how when we eat every two hours, the stomach is constantly working and it can't rest. And then it gets tired. The only exception to that would be if you're eating a meal of only fruit. That will digest in two hours and then you can eat again. Absolutely nothing but water between meals to drink. If you drink any liquids with your meals, the stomach has to absorb the liquid before it can work on the solid. That means the solid sits there and ferments while you're waiting for the liquid to be absorbed. And also, it will di dilute the digestive enzymes. Um, you, the rule of thumb or the principle is to drink, stop drinking 30 minutes prior to a meal and then wait about an hour afterwards. Another one that I put on your list there is to put your fork down between bites. You don't have to load your fork up and wait till your mouth is empty to shovel another one in. We need to be at rest and at peace when we eat. If we eat when we're under stress, then our digestive system, our, especially the stomach, doesn't work as well. Um, pay attention to that little habit. Maybe you don't realize that you're eating too fast. It should take about 15 to 20 minutes minimum to eat a meal. There's two exercises that you can do that are very helpful, especially if you're prone to overeat or if you need to cut back on calories. One of them is to push away from the table and, and, uh, before you feel stuffed, and the other one is to turn your head from side to side and say, no thank you, I've had enough. Um, eat with thanksgiving in your heart. They've actually done studies that show that if you sit down and ask a blessing over your food before you eat and eat with a thankful heart, your food will digest better. Those who just sit down and start eating, they don't have as good a digestion. So I thought that was interesting. Here's another saying that you can memorize. Eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and supper like a pauper. And uh, the, the point is that breakfast is our largest meal of the day, and um, we're breaking a fast. We're also putting um, energy into our bodies to have something to burn during the morning. A moderate meal in the middle of the day, and then if you eat a third meal, a light meal that's easily digested at least three hours before you go to bed, so that you can rest during the night. Even though we don't think about it, <clears throat> our stomach needs to rest while we're sleeping. If we eat too close to bedtime, our stomach is working hard all night long, and then when we wake up in the morning, we don't feel hungry. We're tired. So just try that little change there. Another one we talked about yesterday some is the combination of vegetables and fruits. They take different enzymes and different lengths of time to digest, so it's better not to eat them at the same meal. The fruits digest quickly, or in a shorter amount of time, then they have to wait until the vegetables are to the same point of digestion because the stomach will not release its contents until everything is at the same point of digestion. We also talked about um, um, eat snacking, and I'm going to just interject that here. Um, whenever you eat a meal, say, say you eat breakfast, and then in a couple of hours you eat a snack of some sort, the breakfast meal has to stop and wait until that new food catches up to the same point of digestion. So what happens? We have fermentation. Fermentation means it forms alcohol, it forms gas and bloating, you might get a headache, you might feel um, tired. All of those things are related to the combination. The next one is to avoid fried foods, visible fats like cheese and peanut butter, fat-based gravies, fat-based mayonnaise and salad dressings. All of those things 
not only are higher in calories, but they slow down our digestion. And those of us that don't have a gallbladder, or if you have liver or gallbladder challenges, you will not digest your fats as easily. So they slow down digestion and they put excess calories in the diet. Irregularity in eating destroys the healthful tone of the digestive organs and destroys health and cheerfulness. Um, I gave the example yesterday, I'll just review again quickly. Um, have you ever known children that are eating constantly and they're irritable? They're no fun to be around. And the opposite is true. Children who eat regular meals, they're happy, they're full of energy, they're easy to be around most of the time. So if you just remember this little point that when we are not regular with our eating, it destroys the tone, the, the, the way our digestive organs work. And it takes away our cheerfulness. If dinner is eaten an hour or two before the usual time, the stomach is unprepared. Our stomach gets used to that regular time within 30 minutes, and it, be it begins to prepare for the meal because it knows it's time that it should receive some food. So again, if dinner is eaten an hour or two before the usual time, the stomach is unprepared for the new burden, for it has not yet disposed of the food eaten at the previous meal and does not have vital force for the new work, thus the system is overtaxed. Neither should the meals be delayed an hour or two to suit circumstances. Have you ever been so busy shopping and running errands or so busy at work that you don't stop to take the time to eat? I just have to do this one more thing and then I'll go eat. Bad news. The stomach calls for food at the time it is accustomed to receive it. If that time is delayed, the vitality of the system decreases and finally reaches so low an ebb that the appetite is entirely gone. Then if we take food, the stomach is unable to properly care for it. The food cannot be converted into good blood. If we would all eat at regular periods, not tasting anything between meals, we would be ready for the meal and find a pleasure in eating that would repay us for the effort. There's a promise with every command, isn't there? Most people enjoy better health when eating two meals a day rather than three. Some under existing circumstances may require something to eat at supper time, but this meal should be very light. In other places we're told that people who are doing heavy physical work and children that are growing very fast, they, they would need three meals a day. But the last meal should be light. But we're not to compare ourselves with other people and say this is how I do and that's how you should do it because I know that it works for me. You can share how, how it works for you and that you feel better about it, but don't be judgmental and critical if others are not able or willing to do the same. Never cheat the stomach out of what health demands and never abuse it by placing upon it a load which it should not bear. Cultivate self-control. Do you know what the word cultivate means? When you're growing a garden, first you have to prepare the ground. Then you plant the seed at the right season. We don't plant seeds in the middle of winter because they die. We wait till spring and it's, the ground is warm. Um, and then we w make sure it gets enough water. If it's not raining, we have to water it. And then as the weeds come up around it, we have to take the weeds out. And we take care of that plant until it bears its, its fruit or its seed. That's what cultivating is. Well, in the same way, we have to cultivate self-control. And maybe another word in thinking about self-control would be to practice self-control. 
When we're faced with a temptation of overeating or eating between meals, we have to ask the Lord to help us recognize it as a temptation. That's the first step. Because so often it has become such a habit that we don't even realize we just do it. You know, we just we just fall into that temptation and, and go with it instead of resisting it. So the first thing we have to do is ask the Holy Spirit to teach us this is a temptation. When we recognize the temptation, then we have to ask the Lord to help us turn from it. And as we develop that habit, we gain self-control. So it takes cultivation. It takes practice. <clears throat> it takes being aware and listening to that still small voice. <clears throat> Restrain appetite and keep it under the control of reason. So if it's only been three hours and you think you're hungry, it's a temptation to eat, but it's better to consult reason and say, hmm, is it time to eat yet? Is it, has it been four or five hours? If it hasn't been, then maybe I'm thirsty. I'll try a glass of water first. Or if you've already eaten and it's not time to eat and you think, oh, I'm feeling really stressed. Some of us are emotional eaters and food is comforting to us. We have to see that as a temptation and reason tells us it's not time to eat and the Holy Spirit is saying that's a temptation we have to find something else to do with our mind and our time at, and our hands at that moment or we'll be reaching into the cookie jar or whatever pulling into the Dairy Queen or whatever we don't want to do that do not feel it necessary to load down your table with unhealthful food when you have visitors the health of your family and the influence upon your children should be considered as well as the habits and tastes of your guests now maybe at first glance those two statements seem to be opposite of each other but I've found in our home that if I prepare food that is somewhat familiar but in a more healthy way people enjoy that and it's an opportunity to share recipes or to share you know whatever um, meets their needs at the moment I just wanted to point out that as I was doing research to put these lectures together, <clears throat> I found that time after time I had the question, well, some of these things I'm presenting to you are counsel that was given to us in the late 1800s and early 1900s, but what about today? Time after time after time I found articles that said it's better to have regular times for our meals and it's better to space them four or five hours and it's better to have two or three meals but I can't cite all of those articles there's too many another point that I found is that sometimes we feel weak and faint and we think we're hungry when really it's because the digestive organs have been too severely taxed and they need to rest Do you have any trouble with acid reflux, flatulence or gas, belching, delayed digestion, bloating? Sometimes those things are related to the fact that we can't, our bodies can't handle the food that we give it, but often it's because we're not eating at regular intervals. We're eating too often, um, and also because we're not drinking enough water. Another point is that we should have a, a limited variety at our meals. It's best to not have more than three or four kinds of food at one meal. And our food should be prepared simply and presented nicely. There's nothing more pleasing to the appetite than to sit down to a table that's colorful and nicely arranged and served in beautiful dishes. and. Um, I, we were staying with Adriana and, and Cornelia and 
she does a nice job of that. And, and I told her the other day, I said, you know, we're just used to put the pots on the table. <laughs> she said, but I want you to have the nice dishes. So it's nice. It really, it really helps you feel relaxed and um, welcome. And it helps our digestion to, to have that nice presentation. When there's so much food on the table, we're tempted to eat more than, than we can digest. The overburdened stomach cannot do its work properly. The stomach is designed to hold one liter of food, but it can stretch to hold four liters. That's a lot of food. That's like piled up. And we often do that at fellowship dinner potluck. Or if we go to a buffet, we think we have to get our money's worth, and so we go back three or four times. The stomach doesn't like that. The result is a disagreeable feeling of dullness in the brain. The mind does not act quickly, and indigestion is often the result. And sometimes, even if they're in, like you're eating a vegetable meal and everything is in that category, some foods don't agree with the others. Or if you're forgetting and putting fruits and vegetables together. Fermentation sits in, the blood is contaminated, and the brain is confused. I'm, I'm noticing your faces. You're telling me that you've all had that experience. Serious injury is done to the delicate digestive organs when we overeat. The stomach protests, but it seems to be in vain, and it appeals to the brain. It's like the stomach says, hey, brain, can't you tell that guy to stop it? And, and the stomach says, I'm doing my best. I'm, I hurt, and I'm telling him, and he just won't listen. Suffering is the consequence, and disease takes the place of health. So I just want to challenge you to remember these principles and help yourself to better health. The society that we live in here in North America demands constant eating. Where We see billboards, we see magazine advertisements. If you watch television, there's food everywhere. You drive down the street and the smells insult your senses. You go into somebody's home and they say, oh, come eat, eat, eat. But I just ate. I can't eat right now. But, I, but you have to eat. It's our culture. We have friends like that. And I know a lot of you are, have that same cultural thing. It's, it's hospitality to invite people to eat. But you would do your friends a better service to invite them to have a drink of water and come sit and visit. And then maybe later have something to eat. Another point I like to make is we've forgotten that three-fifths of the word death, right in the middle of it, is the word eat, E-A-T. You see that? I need another slide here. Okay. There it is. Okay. You see this word death right there in the middle? This is the word eat. We're digging our graves with our fork. Sometimes we might write on a um, grave marker, killed by the hand of a good cook or killed by the use of a fork. <clears throat> we don't think of, our, of eating usually as, as slow suicide, but some people are doing that. That's why it says we're digging our graves with our forks. They're eating the wrong kinds of food. They're eating too much of it. We're getting an, an epidemic of obesity, obesity or obesity now because we're eating the wrong kinds of foods. This little graph is um, showing us the kinds of foods that are advertised. This was in 2005. The largest amount of advertising is spent on candy, sugared cereal, fast food, sodas, and soft drinks. So what do you think we're buying to feed our children and ourselves if we don't know these principles? The smaller amount of advertising is fruit juices, breads and pastries, dairy, prepared foods, and dine-out restaurants. So we're in a sense that that 
So much advertising is spent because we, as a nation, we listen to it and we respond to it. Um, is the ways of the world, isn't it? Is, um, we're buying into the advertising without understanding whether those foods or foul foods, what do you, what do you call it, pretend foods, uh, would really be helpful to us. We buy them because we hear they might be or because they might taste good. So we're going to talk about breakfast here for a minute. There's increasing evidence that breakfast is the most important uh, meal of the day for our brains. Studies have shown that when students are given a healthy breakfast, it has a positive effect on their cognitive function. That means their ability to remember and retain what they learn. That's why we see, at least in the States, we see the school lunch program has expanded to include breakfast. A lot of children, their parents are working and they're not home to prepare a breakfast for them and so they go off to school with nothing or maybe a Pop-Tart or you know, something sugary with not much nutrition. And they're finding that when the children have a breakfast, they do better on their tests, their grades go up, they can have creative ideas, and they come to school. Their school attendance is better. Breakfast kickstarts our metabolism and the brain function at the beginning of the day. So <clears throat> when we eat breakfast, it's kind of like a wood stove. You put a piece of wood in there and it'll burn for a while and then you have to put some more in. So our meals are kind of like that. We have to have something to burn the energy that we're, that we're putting out. It's a good idea to choose foods that are high in fiber and dense in nutrition like whole grains and fruits. And again, I recommend that you eat breakfast like a king lunch like a prince, and supper like a pauper. And I've tried to illustrate that here. Oops, what happened? Okay. I've tried to illustrate that here. This is a breakfast of cereals and fruits and toast, and they've got cheese on there. I'm not recommending that, but um, lunch is an entree, maybe a potato and a salad, and then supper is light, a fruit and fruit or soup or salad. You have to use your imagination. Roger and I started learning more of this principle about 20 years ago, and we decided to, to eat our supper-type meal for breakfast. So he was needing to leave for work about 6.30 in the morning. That meant I had to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to fix a big meal, and I didn't mind. It was my gift to him, but <clears throat> it does take some planning. And it took us about two weeks to adjust to eating spaghetti for breakfast or a baked potato or a salad or you know something for breakfast that we weren't used to because we were used to cereal. Or, and, there, and there's nothing wrong with eating cereal at breakfast. That's just what we chose to do. And we, we still, once or twice a week, have a bowl of porridge for breakfast. So just, I'm just challenging you to be creative and think outside of the box that you're in. Here's a picture of the vegetarian pyramid. The, the uh, largest portion of our food choices should come from the, the um, category of whole grains, cereals, pastas, and six to 11 servings per day. The next level is the vegetable group, three to six servings, and the fruit group, two to four servings. Now a serving of the, of the first group is about one cup. A serving of vegetables is one half cup cooked and one cup raw. And a serving of fruit is one small apple or a small banana. So it's not difficult to get that number of servings in a day. The um, vegan Dairy products would be your soy milk and your tofu and your um, rice and almond and oat milks, that kind of thing. Um, your, the legumes, nuts, seeds, and meat substitutes. 
you eat those moderately, only two or three servings a day. The, I don't recommend the meat substitutes except for a, a period of time to transition away from meat. And the reason for that is because they're highly processed, they have a lot of salt and a lot of other chemicals in them, and they're very difficult to digest. So if you choose to use those things, find ones that have a, a short list of ingredients, not the, take up half the label, and use them only occasionally or rarely. And the last group would be the fats and oils eat sparingly, sweets and salt. Eat those sparingly. <clears throat> We're going to talk again just for a few minutes about combinations. I don't mean to drive this into the ground, but it's really important. So the first one again is vegetables and fruits to eat them at separate meals. Would you go to the next slide here? because again they require different enzymes and the fruits will ferment while waiting for the vegetables. And the other point that I haven't made yet is that when you eat fruits and vegetables together they produce an acid condition in the stomach and we want to work towards more alkaline. Okay. Proteins and starches do not digest well together. I'm just giving you a brief overview of food combinations. You can study this in depth and till the cows come home probably. Do you know that saying? It's a long time. Um, but, but just briefly, um, proteins and starches do not digest well together. Fats slow down digestion, so we already talked about that. Overeating can cause fermentation but also the use of milk and sugar at the same time creates, our body creates an alcohol. There was a little study done with some student nurses. Excuse me just a second. They were given homemade ice cream, which is milk, eggs, sugar, maybe some fruit. And they were allowed to eat all they wanted good stuff, right? Tastes good. And um, before they ate the ice cream, their blood was drawn and measured the level of alcohol in their blood, which was zero. And after they ate the ice cream, they had above the legal limits of, of alcohol in their blood. Isn't that amazing? That means they, were, they could have been pulled over and given a drunk driving ticket. So what is milk and sugar combinations? When I was growing up and my mother fixed a bowl of oatmeal, we poured milk and lots of sugar on it. Custards, ice cream, um, puddings, um, sugar cereals and you put milk on it. Somebody asked me what about the milk substitutes. A lot of those are sweetened. I would be careful using those and I haven't been able to find any research that that bears that out, but I'm guessing that it's the combination of the protein in the milk with the sugar that causes that, that alcohol to form. So if, if you buy the milk substitutes, check the labels and make sure they don't have sugar added to them. We have a whole lecture on sugar coming up, so, but even the cane juice or the barley malt are sugars, so just be aware of that. And we also ta have already talked about drinking liquids with our meals. So just to review, proteins, <coughs> here's some simple principles to keep in mind when you're planning your meals. Proteins and non-starchy vegetables go together well. The grains and starchy vegetables or the non-starchy. Do you know what I mean by starchy and non-starchy? Okay, your starchy vegetables are like your potatoes, your parsnips, your carrots and beets. Those are starchy vegetables, sweet potatoes. Your non-starchy vegetables are your peppers and your tomatoes and your green beans and your, your other vegetables. So proteins, uh, protein doesn't go with potatoes. 
but it will go with your green beans and squash, zucchini squash. Winter squash is a starchy vegetable. But your grains, like rice, will go with either starchy or non-starchy. Fruits are best eaten alone as a complete meal. It's, it's not wrong to eat a piece of bread or a cracker with your fruits, but it's better to eat the fruit by itself. Nuts, avocados, seeds, and coconut combine well with the non-starchy vegetables. <clears throat> Another key to planning meals is to think about color. Again, the presentation is so beautiful when you have so much color. Think of your reds and your yellows and your greens and your purples. And you can throw some white in there too. And the textures. Think, think of textures when you put things together. One example I like to use when I'm illustrating this point is that we, most of us just without thinking about it would not serve a whole meal with only a, a plate of mashed potatoes and some steamed cauliflower and some mushrooms sliced up on the plate. It's all white. But you could have cauliflower and mashed potatoes and put some something green and something red and some yellow with it and you'd have a beautiful presentation. So do you see my point? You want to, you want to appeal to the eye as well as to the stomach. When I was growing up my grandmother taught me that we don't have leftovers at our house and she was always fixing leftovers it seemed like. She called them planned overs. And I've adapted that a little bit. For example, if you cook a big pot of rice today, then you could have rice and vegetables for your meal today. And tomorrow you can have um, some rice for breakfast. And then on the third day, if you fix that much, you could do something else with it. Make a rice pudding. Or, um, or you could cook a big pan of potatoes and have a few for mashed potatoes for dinner today and tomorrow you can make a potato salad. So you're combining your energies into one thing and then you're planning several meals with it. So you're not reheating leftovers but you're planning to have enough to work with so that you're not working hard every day. We, it's not a good idea to fix a large meal and then you eat the same thing for four days. You not only lose the nutrition, but you lose the interest of the people you're feeding. I understand that this community here has cooking classes from time to time. And one of the things we would like you to do if you're interested in that is let us know how to contact you so you can be notified when they schedule those. <coughs> It's fun to get together and share new recipes, and it's fun to see them demonstrated and taste them so you know, oh, I'd like to try that. My family would probably like that. So that's something in the future. Excuse me. Again, we must take responsibility for our choices. You're the only one that can bend your elbow and put your fork in your mouth. No one is forcing you. Nobody's holding a gun to your head while you sit at the table and telling you you have to eat that. You make the choices based on how your body feels and what you're, you've learned and reason how to make your, feed yourself so that your body works better. In Proverbs chapter 23, verses 1 through 3, we're told, when you sit down to eat with a ruler, Consider diligently what is before you, and put a knife to your throat if you're a man given to appetite. Don't have any desire for his dainties, for they are deceitful food. They'll, they'll trick you. It tastes good on your lips, but then it stays forever on your hips. That's one saying. But, there, but it, it damages our, our digestive system. And if we sit at a table like that, we're tempted to overeat. If you would take the time to read the accounts of Noah's day and the times of Sodom and Gomorrah, you would see that they were eating and drinking to excess. 
And we know today that overeating not only taxes the digestive organs and leads to fermentation, but it also numbs the brain and wrong moral decisions are made. Um, we were acquainted with a gentleman about 12 years ago who opened and operated a private prison in California. And he worked with the state system, but it was privately owned and operated. And so this prison was um, for people that were going to be released to the community within a year and a half. So they had to be with eight, within 18 months of their release date. <clears throat> and the prison was divided in half. They could choose to be on the side that, that he was operating with these principles, or they could choose to just stay with the regular prison system. Well, the things that he did were, first of all, he respected the people. He called them by name instead of calling out a number. Or um, he made sure they got dental care. He taught them. He set up a system to teach them a vocation so that when they went out into the community, they had a way to earn a living. And do you know what else he did? He fed them broccoli and whole grain breads and brown rice and the nutritious things. And you know what? Those people, they didn't have any violence on that side. People were waiting. There, there was a waiting list. People wanted to get into that program. And they didn't come back. So the point that when we, don't, when we overeat or we choose the wrong foods, it leads to wrong moral decisions was proven out in that little experiment. And, there, and that's been repeated in other areas if they, they find that if they feed the people in jail and prison nutrition instead of junk or less healthy food, they do better. So I was pretty excited to know that. Think about it. We're told that as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, so will it be just before Jesus comes. Would you rather eat simply for health or eat to excess because it tastes good? I have to ask myself this question often. Even something so benign or seemingly harmless as a fellowship dinner at church is a temptation to overeat. And many of the combinations that are there yesterday seem to be pretty good, but often we find that the combinations don't give us good blood or nerves. And then we feel sleepy, and we can't think clearly. But it all comes down to the choices that we make, reasoning from cause to effect. So I hope that this overview has given you <coughs> Uh, the opportunity to realize that the choices we make every day have a lasting effect not only here on us physically and on our families as we prepare and plan meals for them, but it also has an effect on us for eternity. So with that, um, we, we'll close with prayer and then we'll open it up for questions. Shall we bow our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for helping us to understand a little more clearly how special you, you have valued us to give, it, give us this information. Thank you for providing us with the ability to learn and reason and understand and to make choices based on the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Please help us as we go from this place to choose health. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. First question, what do you think about having juice, fruit or vegetable juice, between meals? Here's my answer to that. Um, anything you put in your stomach between meals that requires digestion will delay the digestion of the food that was there before. So the 
you can make a meal out of juice, of fruit or vegetable juice, and then wait a couple of hours before you eat something. But if you're using it between meals, before that four hours is of digestion time has passed after a meal, then you're delaying the digestion of the food. And the question is, uh, are there other things that make alcohol? Um, the question is eggs, milk, or cheese. The milk and sugar combination produces alcohol. Eggs um, are very acidic, acid forming, and they're very high in protein and it's not recommended that we eat them. They also, some articles that I've read say that when you eat eggs, it kind of acts like glue in your body. <clears throat> so sometimes there's medicinal reason to use eggs, or, um, but it's not recommended as a steady thing in our diet, item in our diet. And the other thing is that as the disease, as the sinfulness of man increases, the disease in animals increases. And this time that we're living in, the animals are very diseased. They're, the, especially the meat and dairy industry, the, there's a lot of hormones and antibiotics, and the conditions that the animals are in is not healthy for them. And so for all of those reasons, eggs are not a good choice. And cheese, um, Cheese doesn't cause fermentation, but it's, we're counseled that it should never enter the stomach, and it does delay digestion, and it's very difficult, if not impossible, to digest. So for that reason, it might cause bloating and gas and some of the other symptoms of fermentation, but it's not actually fermenting. I'll try. The question is to clarify. Okay. Okay. I, I, the question was, can we clarify the difference between fruits and vegetables and what is starchy and what is grains? The botanical or biological definition of a fruit is that part of the plant which carries the seed. So if we go by that definition, we get really stressed about it because a tomato, a green bean, a lemon, a, a banana, all of those are fruit or an apple. But I like what Dr. Agatha Thrash taught and probably still teaches is that if it grows in the garden, it's a vegetable. If it grows on a tree or a vine, it's a fruit. Okay, because if you think about it, if you reason it out, you're not likely to put a tomato and an orange in the same meal. We just don't do that. We don't eat bananas and green beans together, you know. So um, we don't eat apples and potatoes at the same time. And so we need to broaden our concept and understand that we're not going to eat a salad and a cup of orange juice. Um, or an orange. Some recipes will tell you to make those combinations, but if we reason from principle, we will uh, change that recipe. Um, does that help? Okay. And then um, protein is found, God, when God created food, when God created the plants that give us food, he was perfect. He put a perfect balance in every item of food. So everything has protein, carbohydrate, and fat in it. An avocado is primarily fat, but it's a really good source of protein. And it has some carbohydrate. An orange has 8% of its calories is from, pro from um, fat. 8% of its calories is from protein in an orange. But you don't think of orange as a, as a protein food, do you? What do you lose there? Um, so let's see. And other, other proteins, oats are the highest protein grain. Your nuts are a good source of protein. Did you know that cashew is not a true nut? Cashew, I, had a, I was teaching a class one time, and... Um, 
lady's husband was very allergic to the nuts. And I was giving recipes using cashews, and so she wanted to know if the cashew was a nut and if she could use it, because her husband would stop breathing if he ate a walnut or a pecan. And so I had to go to the library and do some research. And what I learned is that the cashew is in the mango family. And it's a fruit about this big. And at the end of the, on the outside, at the end of the fruit is the cashew nut, like a little hook. And they harvest that. In South America, they use the fruit. And I have a friend that lives down there. And she came home to visit one time. And she brought us this drink that they love down there, made from the cashew fruit. They call it cashew. I, I couldn't even drink it. It smelled like burnt tire rubber. You know the tires on your car when you burn it? And it oh. But they like it. So anyway, the cashew nut is not a true nut. It's, a, it's the seed on the outside of the fruit that comes from the mango family. You can eat any nuts with fruit. Yeah, but the, but the, no, it's not, cashew is in the nut category, but it's not a true nut. Just like peanuts are not a true nut, they're in the legume family, but we use them like nuts. So the, the legumes, the beans are very high in protein, but they're starchy. They have a lot of carbohydrate in them, and there's a little bit of fat in the beans. So, but we think of them when we're preparing a meal as a protein. Um, and is there another question about the proteins before I go on? Mushrooms are in the f family of fungi, funguses. Mushrooms seem to be a controversial question, and I'll just tell you some of the comments that I get, and I don't agree with any of them. <laughs> Um, the first one, the most common one, is, oh, I could never eat mushrooms because of the way they're grown. Well, typically mushrooms are grown on a compost. Sometimes it's manure, sometimes it's, you can find them in the forest on the, on the leaves that have been broken down over the years. That's a nice soil for the mushrooms. It's loose and fresh, and they come right up. But my argument back to that is when we have gardens, we have to put something on the soil to enrich it, and it's usually either chicken manure, we use llama manure, or sometimes chicken manure, or we can go to the store and buy sterilized steer manure. So I don't get the point. You know, why is, why is there an objection to how they're grown? I don't know. Mushrooms come from a spore. Some people object to mushrooms because they're not grown from a seed, therefore they must not be in the original diet. Well, in my mind, I have a simple mind when it comes to these things. A spore is a form of a seed. It's what starts the new plant. So I don't, I don't agree with that argument. The other day I was listening to a lecture on, <coughs> on one of the satellite channels, and the gentleman was reading from a book that said, Mushrooms have the same ingredients as the, the um, items that make the shell of a seashell. So therefore, they must be in the animal kingdom. Well, I can't buy that either. So I, I haven't checked his resource. I, I just read it. I mean, I just heard it a couple of days before we left. So I eat mushrooms. I think they're, they're, they're high in selenium, which is a trace mineral that we need. Um, the, the Chinese mushrooms like shiitake and maitake and some of those um, the, have been used medicinally for hundreds of years. They're very good to strengthen the immune system. They're helpful in fighting cancer. There's a lot of things that we can use mushrooms for to help us be more healthy. So you have to come to your own conclusion. Some things I just have opinions about. What is your typical breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Before I answer that question, I would just like to recommend to you that I am not a perfect example. 
And so I will share with you, we don't have a routine that we eat this on Monday and this on Tuesday and this on Thursday. Thank you for coming. God bless you. Our just meal of the day. And one of my husband's favorite meals is um, hash browns and scrambled tofu, and I usually fix a green vegetable with that or a, and or a salad. We do that once a week on Sunday morning. That is the traditional thing, I mean, that we do pretty regularly. Um, <clears throat> but otherwise, we just, I'll, I'll have rice a couple of times a week, and I always put at least two vegetables with it. Um, a cooked vegetable and a raw vegetable is what I try to do. And sometimes I'll add a fourth thing in there. Um, and the rice varies. Sometimes I put, if I have zucchini and carrots and mushrooms, I put those in the rice and some onion, some garlic. I just season it with whatever I have. Um, sometimes we have potatoes. We have mashed potatoes or, or um, or I cook them in the oven. I'm just going to tell you quickly here um, a little tip about cooking potatoes. I learned a long time ago in one of my nutrition classes <coughs> um, to prepare to teach nutrition class, uh, cooking classes. And when you cook, turn your heat on your oven to the hottest temperature and cook your potatoes hot and quickly, that it changes the starch so that it's more digestible. So. I will grate my potatoes and lay them out on a cookie sheet that I've sprayed or lightly oiled. Spray it with the oil, you know, in the can, or lightly oil it. And then I season it with garlic, granulated garlic, a little salt, and dill. Put it in the oven, and in 15 minutes it's done. If you cook them on top of the stove in a skillet, you have to use more oil, and they get kind of mushy, and you know, or else they get too fried, and they're difficult to digest with all that oil on them. Or you can cut them like French fries or like um, chips and do the same in the oven. So anyway, that's just a side to the question. Sometimes we eat oatmeal, and I like to cook the raisins or dates in the water for a few minutes before I put the grain in, because then I don't have to use sugar at the table. And then I'll put some wa chopped walnuts or some pumpkin seeds or sunflower seeds in the oats and maybe some other dried fruits and a little bit of soy milk. Sometimes we have toast with it. Um, for lunch, um, I like to make oat patties. Roger really likes them. What's your favorite lunch, Roger? Whatever's, whatever. <laughs> sometimes we make sandwiches. Sometimes, sometimes I'll make another meal. Um, but often I'm gone during the day, and I, so I'll leave a soup prepared. You might have a soup and sandwich, or, or I'll take a sandwich with me. And in, then if we eat a third meal, it depends on what time we ate the other two. Um, we'll have a smoothie, or we'll have smoothies and popcorn, or we'll have waffles, or we'll have a fruit salad, or maybe just put fruit on the table and eat an apple and a, an orange and a banana, something like that. Um, sometimes we have spaghetti. I like the quinoa pasta. Sometimes I make a macaroni and cheese with a cashew cheese on it. But whatever I choose for my main dish, I put two other colorful vegetables with it. And or sometimes I put a fourth item on a salad or a something. So that I hope that helps you give, give you an idea to branch out a little bit. This is just the basics to understand how to start learning to combine the best foods that go together. And so um, if we just understand that proteins need to go with non-starchy vegetables, so you can combine your, your um, your beans with a salad, your, you know, like a bowl of pinto beans with a salad, or garbanzos or whatever, chickpeas. And um, 
your grains will go with either starchy or non-starchy vegetables. So if your grain, is, grain dish is your main part of your meal, then you can choose any vegetable to go with that. You don't have to worry about whether it's starchy or non-starchy. But personally, I don't like to eat pasta and potatoes together. That's too heavy. My stomach doesn't like that. So some of it you just have to go by reason. What is it that you're used to serving and does that meet these combination? I chose, I've studied this in quite depth and I probably could review that and teach you a lot more about food combining, but I think we need to keep it simple. I, you know, just know, don't eat your fruits and vegetables together and um, try to keep your proteins and your starchy vegetables separated. How much percentage of raw food is good for someone with stomach disorder? Um, the, the rule of thumb to be in good health that I've learned over the years is that we should strive somewhere between 60 and 80 percent raw foods and the other foods should be lightly steamed or cooked in a manner that's easy to digest. But if you have a problem with stomach disorder or your colon disorders, you may be not able to tolerate so much raw food. So you have to get acquainted with yourself. Sometimes, especially as women, we t we're so busy to take care of everybody else that we forget to tune in to what's happening with ourselves. So I'm just in encouraging you to, to tune in. And if something doesn't agree with you, but you need to put it on the table for the rest of the family, just don't make an issue of it. You eat what you need to eat and feed your husband or your kids and let them eat what they need to eat. So um, I don't know if that's a good enough answer. How much raw food, what percentage of raw food? Some people recommend 100% raw. I think 100% is difficult, especially for a long time. We can't eat potatoes raw unless you juice them. You can't eat grains raw. You can't eat legumes raw. You need to at least sprout them, um, which is still raw. But you can't just pick up a handful of pinto beans. You can't even chew them. You know, you have to soak them and you have to, you have to cook them. Why not? That's what a, a, do you guys know haystack? That's what a haystack is. You have, you have chips or rice and, um, and a bean and a salad. That's all you're eating. So salad with bread, your grain is your corn chips or your rice, and a salad on top of it, that's a meal. You just don't need three helpings of it. Instead of bread, we eat corn prepared bread called mamaliga. Is that mamaligia? Mam mamaliga. Is it healthy? If you're not allergic to corn, um, and what else is in it? Just corn and water. Hey. Yeah, polenta. Sure. Yeah, polenta. You know what? Most of the world eats like that. In Malawi, they eat zima. That's all it is, is corn and water. That's their main staple. Um, in Mexico, they roll it into tortillas. It's, but it's corn and water. That's all it is. You have to do your research and be careful. You know, you can find some that's not. And in those countries, it's not. Probably in Romania, it's not. You know, but, but corn is on the list of foods that are high, people are highly allergic, commonly allergic to. So if you're eating a lot of it, just, you don't have to eat that much. You know, um, if it's, if you find, when you start tuning into your body symptoms, if you find that it's telling you it doesn't like it, when you eat that food, then reduce the amount that you're eating. Make sure it's well cooked. If you can find some that's not genetically modified, then choose that. But just in general, is corn healthy for you? Yes. I just would make those reservations. When we get older, we need some supplements like B-complex, vitamin C, CoQ10. 
If I have first thing in the morning lemon juice, then 45 minutes later vegetable juice strained without milk or without pulp, then 45 minutes later breakfast, is it wrong? <coughs> As we age and the, the, the common age that this starts happening is somewhere in the middle 40s, we start losing the amount of digestive enzymes that we have. So when we get up to the 70s and 80s and older, we hardly have enough in there to take care of the food that we eat. And so we may need a supplement to help digest our food. <clears throat> Some people that have abused their stomachs or they have a genetic problem that they're allergic to foods or um, have abused their stomachs over the years because they didn't know better may require some digestive enzymes to help them. People who have been on a vegan diet for a very long time sometimes have a B12 deficiency because commonly they'll tell you that B12 only comes from animals and eggs. Um, I think I read the other day that it's dandelion is high in B12. I think that's what I read. I'm always looking for the answer to that problem. Is that, what was it? Sunflower seeds, okay. Vitamin C is, I recommend vitamin C because it helps strengthen the walls of the vessels and it helps build our immune system, strengthen our immune system. Especially during the winter time, we, we need that strength to resist the things that we're exposed to, like flu. <clears throat> CoQ10 is often recommended, especially for uh, heart problems. It helps to strengthen the heart and the blood vessels. Um, I don't know that age has anything to do with that, so you have to go with what your personal problem is and do some research on your own. Um, lemon juice in the water first thing in the morning is an excellent idea. It helps to, what you do is juice a lemon and you can either dilute it with six or eight ounces of water and drink that or you can put it in a liter of water and drink that through the morning. Um, <clears throat> lemon juice um, helps to clean the digestive system and prepare for a meal. It cleanses the liver and it does a hundred and one other things. I, I have a little booklet I meant to bring some on on the benefits of the lemon. I ran across an article just on Thursday. There's been uh, 20 different f um, pharmaceutical companies that have been doing it, tests on lemon and its properties since 1970. And what they've found is that lemon juice is 10,000 times better than chemotherapy especially adriamycin, which is a common chemical that they use to fight cancer because the lemon juice kills the cancer cells. And they're trying to figure out how to, how to make a substitute for that that they can sell in a pill or a, a liquid. Um, but how can we improve on God's packages? That's my question. So lemon juice is very good. And then the rest of the question is 45 minutes later vegetable juice and then 45 minutes later breakfast. There's probably not a problem with that. Um, you might go oh, vegetable juice without the pulp, but you might want to wait a little longer than 45 minutes. I would wait an hour to an hour and a half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, so listen to your body. Your liquids will go through your stomach in about a half an hour. Yeah, right, because you strain it, but it still has calories in it, so it has to stay in the stomach a little longer to mix with the enzymes, so it should be okay. Yes, and the, question, the other question was, what about acid and alkaline? Would you please ask that question again? Yes, I did not bring my food combining chart with me, but I, if I remember correctly, that's right. Do you remember, Adriana, you have that little chart on your refrigerator? It's so acid and subacid fruits. You can combine them. Subacid, yes. 
Yes. Oranges and ask the question. You know, you, you know the little search window on your Google page? You can write a question and put a question mark in there and it will answer the question for you. Yeah. But what I thought you were asking, and I'm going to answer this question, is what about acid forming and alkaline forming foods? When we eat a food, our body processes it and there's an ash that's left in the urine. And that's what they measure to determine whether a food is acid forming or alkaline forming. So an orange is acid out here, it's citric acid. But when you eat it, it becomes alkaline forming. No, not because it's raw, because that's how your body processes it. When it completely is broken down and the ash that's left over is either acid or alkaline. Our bodies are in health when they're mostly alkaline. And when we have over acid body, then we, we're more apt to develop disease. An example of that is cancer. Cancer will thrive in, an, in a low oxygen, high acid, toxic body. And so the best way to help yourself if you have cancer is to clean all that up. Get more oxygen, breathe deeply, get some exercise, eat more alkaline forming foods, and detoxify. Then the body can, then you're assisting the body to help itself to repair and, and regain health. And that's true of any problem, um, but that's an, a good example. So we, we say that you should eat 80% of your food should be alkaline forming, and 20% of your food should be acid forming, but the standard American diet is 80% acid forming and 20% alkaline forming. That's why we have so much illness. So what does that mean? All right, your acid-forming foods are all of the animal products. Anything that has a mother or a face and you eat it is going to make acid in your body. And we're acid-forming, alkaline-forming, we're talking about the pH levels, okay? I don't want to get into the chemistry of that, but that's what we're talking about. So... <clears throat> And all of the grains except for buckwheat and millet are acid forming. Somebody asked me earlier today, and I think she's already gone, but this question also came up yesterday. We eat a lot of bread. Well, I forgot to tell you that yesterday, but I'm telling you now, bread is acid forming because it's made from grain. So just on that basis we need to reduce the amount of acid forming foods and increase the alkaline forming foods. Does that make sense? Okay. So the um, alkaline forming foods are all of your fruits and vegetables and buckwheat and millet. The legumes are kind of in the middle. They can be either and it seems to depend on what, how much you eat at one time. So if you're eating a half a cup to not more than a cup of, of beans. They're, <clears throat> excuse me, they tend to be more alkaline forming, but if you're eating two cups or four cups of beans at a meal, it's going to be more acid forming. And I don't understand that, that body chemistry to tell you why, but that's what I read and understand. So, Adriana, 20% alkaline forming, 80%. It's a goal to work towards. Okay? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm.